This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Africa News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for Pan-African news and world developments. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Coming up on Africa News Tonight... ANC representative for international relations, Obed Bapela, says his government will send a special envoy to Washington to better explain its relationship with Moscow. That's reporter Darren Taylor on South Africa's effort to ease tensions with Washington. Details coming up. Also, concerns grow about fighting in Ethiopia's Amhara region. And Botswana aims to work with a U.S. university to expand medical care. We'll have these stories and more on African News tonight. We start with our top story. Residents in northern Ethiopia's Amhara region say local fighters briefly took over a police station and seized weapons amid ongoing clashes between protesters and the military. The fighting was sparked last week when Ethiopia's government ordered all regional forces to integrate with federal forces or regional police. Amhara residents say gunfights have erupted in cities and authorities have shut off the Internet. Maya Masakira reports from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. In the Amhara region town of Mazezo, residents say they heard heavy gunfire early Wednesday as armed Amhara fighters took over a police station. One resident who did not want to be identified due to security concerns told VOA the fighters were after a delivery of weapons. He says at around 4 a.m. there was heavy gunfire at the police station and bullets were raining down on their roofs. When we asked the police what happened, he says they told us they hit us. He says they first asked them to hand over the weapons without force, then came the gunshots, and there was a lot of them. The fighters packed up the weapons, he says, and left around 5.30 a.m. Protests and clashes erupted in Ethiopia's Amhara region last week after the government ordered regional forces like Fano to integrate into the federal military or police. While the numbers of those injured in the region's clashes could not be immediately confirmed, Reuters news agency quoted the mayor of Kombolcha as saying several people were shot there on Tuesday. Mayor Mohamed Amin told Reuters protesters attacked an army camp after false rumors spread that federal troops had taken Amhara regional fighters into custody. Witnesses reported casualties in the city of Debrabrahan, 130 kilometers northeast of Addis Ababa, though numbers could not be confirmed. One resident, who would only give his first name, Isaias, told VOA there have been ongoing clashes since Tuesday. He says protesters are refusing to let security forces enter, while defense forces are saying they will control the town. Isaias says Fano and the residents of the town have taken up whatever they can, such as sticks or machetes, and they are waiting. He says Ethiopia's defense forces have heavy weapons. This is the fighting that is taking place. Residents tell VOA authorities have taken their usual response of shutting down Internet access in cities like Gondar and Amhara's regional capital, Bahadar. An explosion at a bar in Bahadar on Monday killed two people and wounded several others. Aid group Catholic Relief Services said two of its staff were shot and killed on Sunday in Amhara as they were returning to Addis Ababa. While it was not immediately clear if the deaths were related to the unrest, they have underscored concerns about worsening insecurity in the region. Yunus Adai is the former director of the Institute for Peace and Security Studies at Addis Ababa University. He says the integration of regional forces is needed for a lasting peace. Nine or 11 special armies. That is really not amicable for Ethiopia's economy, social development and sustainable security. Ethiopia's federal government has not confirmed casualty figures from the clashes and unrest in Amhara. Last week, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said regional forces would not be disarmed, but vowed their integration would be carried out by force if necessary. Ethiopia is emerging from a devastating two-year war in the north of the country after the federal government and Tigrayan forces signed a peace deal in November. Amhara forces fought alongside the Ethiopian and Eritrean armies against the Tigrayan rebels in the war, which left hundreds of thousands of people dead and displaced millions. Mayam Sikar for VOA News, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. 
Botswana is facing a critical shortage of medication at public health facilities, has turned to the Baylor College of Medicine in Texas for supplies and expertise in vaccine manufacturing. Due to global supply chain challenges, Botswana has found it difficult to procure drugs with shortages persisting for more than a year. From Habrone, Botswana, reporter Mokondisi Dube has the details. Botswana has been battling drug shortages since March 2022, and the crisis has particularly affected children and the elderly who suffer from chronic illnesses. Minister of Health Edwin Dikolodi says their partnership with Baylor College of Medicine announced this week is already bearing fruit. We have a vaccine production and fellow placement in Houston, which forms part of our building of the ecosystem around vaccine manufacturing. We have had the surgical outreach last year, and we have also had the drug procurement that delivered 62 tons of medications and supplies since January of 2023. We await delivery of more medical supplies in the coming weeks. Michael Mizwa, chief executive at Baylor School of Medicine, says the partnership will result in the transfer of skills from the Texas-based medical school to Botswana. This, he says, will help the country manufacture its own vaccines in the long term. As XFC president of the CC has been to Houston, Texas uh, on a number of occasions over the past few years. There has also been a call to action from His Excellency, and that is to help Botswana um, not only embrace but achieve a knowledge-based economy. And in doing so, um, our leadership have now made multiple trips to Botswana to do just that. Baylor School of Medicine has established an outlet Baylor Botswana in Haboronim. Mohamed Matsaba is Baylor Botswana's executive director. The biggest problem that we have in this country is not necessarily the resources or money. It's um, we have very low numbers of patients. So procuring five doses, a manufacturer, wherever they are, will laugh at you and say you don't have enough numbers. Second, um, some of these diseases like cancer, they will use very, very specific drugs at uh, intervals. And again, ordering for them and then waiting, they expire and all of that. So the balancing act that comes with this makes it difficult for the ministry to actually procure and have enough supplies over time. The shortage of medication has also been blamed on some pharmaceutical companies halting the manufacturing of certain drugs as it is not profitable to justify production for VOA. This is Mkondi C. Dube in Havroni, Botswana. The South African government will send a special envoy to Washington soon as tensions build between it and the Biden administration. The ruling African National Congress has recently taken several actions the United States government and the lawmakers disapprove of. They include participating in military exercises with China and Russia and several ANC officials visiting Moscow. Darren Taylor reports. Pretoria recently allowed two Iranian warships under sanction by Washington to dock in Cape Town. The U.S. Embassy responded with a diplomatic note warning South Africa risked sanctions itself by doing this. U.S. authorities have issued similar warnings before when sanctioned Russian vessels sailed into South African ports. The U.S. also is disappointed by the African National Congress government's refusal to condemn Russian President Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Former U.S. diplomat Brooks Spector says the ANC's recent meeting in Moscow with Putin's United Russia Party in particular has caused head-shaking on Capitol Hill. By having a senior official showing up in Russia to pledge support and friendship in military and security spheres, that's bound to have an impact on people in Washington. Another complication lies ahead. South Africa hosts the BRICS summit in August. The economic grouping of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. Putin is invited despite the International Criminal Court arrest warrant for him. ANC representative for international relations Obed Bapela says his government will send a special envoy to Washington to better explain its relationship with Moscow. 
This friendship, he says, is based on the ANC's historical ties with the former Soviet Union. Bapela says this doesn't mean the Ramaphosa administration supports the war in Ukraine or that it's anti-American. He says the ANC had strong relationships in America even while the Soviet Union was backing its armed struggle against apartheid. And we'll go to those people that supported us during that time to also talk to the lawmakers and any other eminent person and big businesses that are investing in South Africa to say we remain non-partisan, but also we are engaging with Russia around how do we then begin to end the war? What would it be that Russia would want to see happening? Spectre says this is the problem for many in the U.S., South Africa seems only to care about Russia's desires. It doesn't acknowledge the suffering of Ukrainians and Putin's invasion of a sovereign nation. Bapela says the South African envoy will make the point that the government opposes all war. So Washington is unfair to suggest South Africa could be punished for having a strategic alliance with Moscow. We are for a multipolar system no country must dominate others must not threaten the others must not have unilateral sanctions on each other we need them to also ensure that the international law is applied equally there are people who waged the war in iraq george bush the former president of us who was never indicted by the icc president obama on the issue of libya the killing of Gaddafi. no sanctions were imposed on anybody and also The ISIS did not even come in near that situation. Spectre says the ANC's pro-Russian stance is clear and is not going to go down well in Washington. He says President Joe Biden's administration could exclude South Africa from the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which gives eligible African countries duty-free access to U.S. markets for thousands of products. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. Ten migrants drowned as their ship sank Tuesday off the coast of Tunisia. They had been heading to Europe. The French news agency AFP says 72 were rescued from the shipwreck near the city of Soufax. The deaths are part of a deadly trend. The International Organization for Migration said today the first three months of 2023 had been the deadliest first quarter for migrants crossing the Mediterranean since 2017. At least 441 have died as they try to reach Europe between January and March. The IOM says a drop in state-run search and rescue operations were a factor in at least six deadly incidents this year. So far, 31,192 people have reached Italy, which yesterday declared a state of emergency regarding undocumented migrants and is calling for more help from the European Union and others to control the flow. The IOM is calling for states to work together to reduce deaths along migration routes. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Kenya's main opposition party has announced plans for a public rally but said it remained committed to easing political tension through dialogue after anti-government protests turned violent last month. Azimio La Umoja, the party of veteran opposition leader Raila Odinga, has said it will hold direct engagements with the public, including a rally in Nairobi as it prepares for talks with the government. Hermant Maniora is a professor at the University of Nairobi and a political analyst. Douglas Mpuga reached him in Nairobi by phone and began by asking him whether he thinks the proposed dialogue will work. Uh, There is no option. Nobody has an option in the matter. It must work. It will work. The opposition now is planning a town hall on tomorrow, Thursday, and a rally on Saturday, yes. on the weekend. What's the purpose of that? What, how will that advance the dialogue? It's just to show the other side that it doesn't, uh, it is not run short of options. You, you, you carry two things. You, you carry a big stick, the stick and carry carrot. Uh, you know, you also must show your power. The main contentious issues are uh, the high cost of living and the 
contesting the last election that, that was not fair. Do you see those two issues being resolved in the yes, short yes. run? In one way or the other, they will have to be resolved. But as usual with any negotiation, nobody takes out of the negotiations everything they want, and nobody loses everything. Some get, some you lose. Some positions are changed. Some demands are are, are changed. Some demands are are, 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 are are achieved. Others are achieved in a minor way with some amendments. But at the end of the day, there will be some form of uh, agreement on all these issues. And uh, what do you make of the demand by the opposition to include uh, participants in the talks who are not members of parliament? I think basically it can remain a partisan to the extent that the people directing the talks, the calendar of the talks, the agenda and everything else, would be Raila Odinga and William Ruto on both sides. But in terms of uh, opening space for other people to come in, to contribute, to give ideas, to, to give suggestions, that would be a good idea. It would be a good idea for this thing to have some forum outside parliament, informing parliament, and that one outside parliament then can admit other players, other stakeholders, so that people don't feel left out. But ultimately, from where I see, I see, I see, ultimately this thing will become bigger than we all think, and it will have... Uh, it will lead to some kind of national conversation somewhere to produce some sort of national chapter. It can start small the way it has started, but I see it growing into a big thing where Kenyans will sit down, discuss about their, talk about their country. A good thing Kenya has a history of sitting down and resolving those such issues. Yes, yeah, we have done that in the past. It has saved us from disaster. Uh, but we, I think the country has come to the realization. A few people may think otherwise. A few people may be obstinate. A few people may say no. But there, there's this nagging realization that we've been getting it wrong. And we've nearly lost the country on a number of occasions. And it's a time that Kenyans agreed there's something wrong about their country, about their policy. And that's how I'm saying one of these days we'll need to sit down have a national chat, just conversation among ourselves, and come up with a national chat. That was Professor Herman Maniora of the University of Nairobi. He spoke with Douglas Mpuga from Nairobi. Earlier today, we had a technical mishap. Instead of broadcasting the story you just heard, we broadcast a wrong story. We apologize. On VOA Africa Radio, we let the sound tell you the story. News, sports, science and entertainment. Available to you 24-7. Tune in on your local FM stations. We are also available on the medium waves 909 kHz and 1530 kilohertz. Our short waves are 6080, 15580, 4930, 15165, 15580, and 17530 kHz. VOA Africa, your trusted source for news and information. At this week's annual International Monetary Fund and World Bank meetings in Washington, the IMF says global growth may not climb above 3% for the next five years. That does not bode well for poor countries, including several African nations that are trying to dig out of a massive debt. Harry Varhoven, a senior research scholar at the Center for on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University in New York, tells VOA's Carol Van Dam that even before COVID-19 hit and the war in Ukraine broke out, the debt-to-GDP ratio in African countries was high. The announcement of the IMF didn't catch anyone by surprise, but it does confirm indeed that the prevailing global economic climate is only going to make it harder for some of the world's poorest countries to recover from the damage wrought, of course, by COVID, the war between Russia and Ukraine and the economic fallout on energy prices and food prices that they're wrestling with, but also the buildup of debt prior to March 2020. Because the reality is that especially for African countries, debt to GDP ratios had already uh, reached historically high levels of about 60% uh, in late 2019, and that the emergency response that they've had to provide in the last couple of uh, couple of years has only worsened that, that predicament. And if there is no growth, 
it does indeed become very difficult for them to, to service that debt, let alone to repay it. And earlier this year, Georgieva, because of those conditions, recommended debt restructuring for countries like Ghana and Zambia. Why those two countries and what other countries are being considered for debt restructuring or even debt forgiveness? Well, to probably answer your question, as I said, it's important to remember that a lot of African countries, not just Zambia or Ghana or Ethiopia or Chad or a number of other countries that have actually formally applied for debt restructuring, but a whole range of other states have been gravely worried about their debt predicament and have increasingly seen outsiders uh, get increasingly exasperated about this situation. Now, there's a big blame game that has been played over the last couple of years, where especially from the standpoint of the United States, of its European allies, the main culprit for this has been identified as being China, that China very lavishly uh, distributed a number of funds, a number of credits, sometimes even irresponsibly so, and saddled African countries with these debt mountains. From the Chinese perspective, there's been the retort that actually most of the growth has not been in bilateral debt owed to China by these African countries. But it's debt predominantly owed to private creditors, that is to say to commercial banks or to international investment funds or to various kinds of bondholders who've actually taken on most of that debt and who've proven very intransigent in making any moves on restructuring, even when that some of that debt is proving to be unsustainable. Right. But aren't some of those lenders that you're talking about, private, you know, and commercial banks, aren't they located in China? Some of these are, but the vast majority of these are actually based in London or in New York or in Frankfurt. And this is what makes some of the international mediation around this tricky, because the initiatives that the World Bank and AIMF have so far undertaken have been quite strict on what governments should do and on various ways in which governments, for example, no longer demand repayment, should have the repayment frozen, at least for a year. There was a prior initiative about that or should restructure it. But they have been very relatively light touch as far as private creditors are concerned. And so part of the reason why Georgieva, but also the outgoing head of the World Bank, David Malpas, have been so vocal on this issue is it an effort to try to, on the one hand, if you like, appease or recognize the pressures they're facing from Washington and Brussels, whilst at the same time proving relevant to African and Chinese concerns. And that's why some of the meetings happening this week are so crucial, but also why they will be so, will be so difficult to make concrete progress, whether in the case of Ghana, or the case of Zambia or any of the other cases. That's uh, Harry Verhoeven, senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. He was speaking with my colleague Carol Van Dam from New York, the IMF and World Bank meetings, and on Sunday. You can keep up with developments at the meeting on voaafrica.com and on all our new program, new